that question we ask at interview, which is, okay, you want three days a week, you know, three days a week with us. What do you do the rest of the time? Mm. Always opens up a really interesting conversation. conversation yeah. And I, I love that aspect. That was Annie Flanagan, who is one very busy and driven individual. Annie is the co-founder of Number Lust, the founder of the Entrepreneurs Experiment and the CEO and founder of Better Business Basics. Annie founded Number Lust and Better Business Basics to change the way businesses understand their financials. And she's also passionate about continuing her education in the fields of value networks, knowledge management and financial control models in business. And he has a long-term goal of working in the social entrepreneur space to give back what she knows. Being an advocate of flexibility in the workplace, in particular creating organisations that support parents and those in study, is of the utmost importance to Annie. She supports an increase in women at board and executive level through non-quota means. Please welcome Annie Flanagan. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Bartholomews from You Legal. The Accountants on Purpose podcast showcases inspiring accountants who are leaders in their field. And then it just came to me like a bolt of blue. What makes them tick? Love it. How did they get to where they are? I want to inspire. And what do they do now for their teams, their clients and the world? If you could speak one language other than English, what would it be? Uh, now, it's interesting because my mother is Croatian, my dad's English. We spoke English at home. Yes. But every six week school holidays, we went to Croatia because both my parents wow. were small business owners. Yes. And so we grew up in London, and it was an opportunity for both my mum and dad to kind of shunt us mm. out of the house for six weeks. And so the UK sort of summer holidays, July to September. And so we spoke English at home, but every year, I had the opportunity to speak another language poorly, but I think it does something to your brain. <laughs> totally. So I did French at school. Um, my dad moved to France when I was about 18. And so I really wanted to learn French. Mm. And so I'd love to learn, I'd love to know how to speak French fluently, uh, properly. And grammatically, it's a nightmare. Not Croatian? No. So that <laughs> I can speak. Okay. So that one's okay. But I'm hoping that... <laughs> What I, what it, what those long summer holidays where I just really didn't understand what was being said at all have helped sort of. In the subconscious. Yeah, hopefully somewhere. <laughs> but I did so, um, French, I sort of speak it poorly. Um, I've not really used the opportunities I've been given to sort of do much with it. But I do, I'm using something called Frontastique, I think mm. it's called, which is a subscription. It pops up a new lesson every morning. It's like 20 minutes of hell and then they mark it. Oh, And what's wow. clever about it is where you, where you fail with a capital F, they then repeat that a couple of lessons day. down the line. Oh. Well, not, no, they're, they're, they're actually not that brutal. They do, they give you a bit of time to get over your ego bruising. Okay. And then do it again. Yeah, that but you get amazing. a percentage that pops up. So, and I found that really useful actually. Yeah. It's quite good. Yeah. So where did you grow up? In London, you said. London. So I've been here, I arrived the week... Before 9-11. So that's 2001, I think. Mm. So I've been here nearly 20 years. But so I lived in London, uh, East End girl. We were a working class family. Um, I was the eldest of two children. I've got a younger brother mm -hmm. who still lives back there. Mm -hmm. um, we were always a bit different, I think, because I had a, this sort of English dad and a European mum. Mm. And so, and my mum was quite liberal. Mm -hmm. So we had, my parents weren't normal. So I just remember being at school wanting parents who were normal. Like had jobs. Yeah. That Not had, yeah. So both my businesses. parents were sort of business owners, entrepreneurial. My father was always building something, doing something. And my mum was the same. And so, um, and it's interesting, you look back and you realise that I've actually just followed so I haven't had a job since I was 19. Wow. So I'd be completely unemployable. But um, but I also think one of the things I do remember about my childhood, it was a very feast and famine. Yes. So you, we either had lots of money or we had nothing. Mm. And so depending on the success of my mother's businesses particularly, um, 
would really dictate how we were doing. Mm. And so, and I didn't realise it at the time, but I now look back on it and I realise that it, it absolutely dictated how stressed my parents were, how much money we had, whether we could go on trips, whether we travelled overseas for holidays, whether we had new shoes or whether we had to make things last. Mm. And so, and one of the big hang-ups I've got is about food in the fridge, which I didn't really understand until someone explained to me that it's it's about security. Yeah, you always want to have food in the fridge. Yeah. yeah, so we had times where we would be buying food, you know, for the next few days mm. rather than rather because that's that's how the sort of cash was flowing. Yeah. And so the interesting thing is now is if I run out of milk, it's a really big deal. Yeah. Do you, do you keep a couple of it. like UHT in the fridge <laughs> just in case? Yeah, but it's really weird. Yeah. So it, it, I'm fascinated by how those those experiences as a child mm. change two things, how you view and see and manage money. Mm. And then when you go into business for yourself, how that changes the decisions you make. I have a thing for raincoats. I really <laughs> like that's a bit strange. <laughs> I, and I have been trying to work out what from my childhood mm. means that I just want to buy a coat every time I see one mm. in, a, in the shops. I've just got that so could be an many expensive coats. Habit. I, it I is. just it, it is. I think this is really interesting, and it's a worthwhile exercise to do. I mean, I was. I don't believe in therapy and going to therapy, and um, but it's just um, interesting yeah, to but see it is what, fascinating. Like, where's that from? Driving yeah, you? Where's my from? husband always wants the heater on. <laughs> and I'm the opposite, probably from my upbringing, always yeah. turning lights off, turning heaters off, yeah. you know, especially if you're not in the house, whereas he must have got really Somewhere. cold yeah. at some stage. And he leaves it on all, all night and leaves the kids' bedroom doors open so that they don't get cold at night. Yeah. And I was like, there's something that happened and his mother can't remember and what it was. And I find that bit fascinating. So I think if you have the opportunity to dig in there, I think it, it's curiosity made me think okay I think this is worth it wasn't stressing me out the seriously. food one seems like quite easy to work out yeah that's that's a sort of and there's some there's a fascinating book around I'm trying to think of the name of the title about scarcity mm. and it talks about how how that I mean if you live in a country like Australia you, you know what's the very worst that can happen mm. I mean we have we have quite a quite a good safety net in this mm, country it's definitely. not as if you're going to be out in the street so yes. so so that fear is irrational mm. um but I found going through the process of understanding some of that stuff really interesting. Mm, especially because you have, like, heritage that could have had yes. trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Quite close. Yeah. Um, which so many Australians do, like, with such a multicultural yeah. society. So how that kind of so plays my mother's, out. So my mother's childhood was interesting. I mean, she, she went, she was, uh, she very much went to school the local schoolhouse at mm. the end. I mean, that, I mean, Yugoslavia in those days was run by it was it was a communist communist um, mm. run state, so there wasn't a huge amount of money. So I understand her having that, but interestingly enough, um, my mother doesn't have that fear of not be, of being without. Mm. But I do. It's bizarre. Mm. So it's almost like it's it's jumped. jumped. Yeah. So thanks, mum. Mm. <laughs> so our parents to thank for so much, yes, and our children will be the same. <laughs> was your favorite subject at school uh biology which was unusual because i left school at 17 Mm. because and interestingly enough my daughter then chose biology nothing to do with me at all but i think she had a similar experience um she had a fantastic teacher i had a fantastic teacher and so it taught me something really important around you can have a difficult subject or a boring subject made absolutely fantastic by the person teaching and so i had a subject which was quite tough um I wouldn't have said I had a brain for sciences necessarily, but he just he just brought this subject to life, yes. which was just amazing. Yeah, so a um, bit of a surprise. I think I think both my parents were a bit um, dumbfounded when I came home and said, "Right, I want to do biology," because I actually I've never used anything I've learned. <laughs> I think. Whereas my daughter's gone on to be a, um, is trained to be a midwife. So her, I understand, yeah. you know, choosing biology. But I just, it was just one of, the, I was very arty at school. Um, I loved sort of creative things. And so it was a bit of a weird choice, but he was a fantastic teacher. That's awesome. You started Better Business Basics, which I always have. It's a bit of a tongue twister. It is. It's, it's hard oh. to say. In 2006, so that was five years after you arrived from yeah. England. And it's still going strong. Mm. What do you attribute to its success? Oh, it, it does feel like um, 
30 years, I think, you know, you sort of, I think small business land, you tend, it's a bit like a dog's life, you know, you sort of have for every one year, it actually is seven. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think there's, there's a couple of things I think. I, we're obviously a people business, we're a service-based business. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, um, you really, your product uh, is, is the, the, or an extension of the people that you have working for you. And I think, um, and I just think I've been very fortunate with the people that have joined, you know, good, bad and indifferent. So, you know, you that I think the employment journey is probably one of the most challenging of mm, having a business. Definitely. Um, you know, and, and I don't know if you can really teach somebody. I, th- I think you can teach somebody to be better around people, but I think it's also a bit like parenting. It is something that you get better at the more you do. Yes, because I was a terrible manager to start with. I mean, the first like, couple of employees, I'm sorry. I'm just like like... choosing the right employees as well. Yeah, but the problem is I think is that I sort of want to go back and revisit the <laughs> first <laughs> five hires and say, look, I'm really sorry. Mm. But I do think that you, you, I think you go into it saying I'm going to employ somebody, um, you know, we're now big enough to have somebody come and help or come and join. Mm. And I just think you have no idea what you're doing. And so it's no. a bit of an you experiment. You don't even really know what you need help with no but that's the point is I think I think you think you you think you're doing all right and you you know you read loads of books and you speak to lots of people but the the truth is you just don't know what you're doing and I and I think I've got I hope I've got better I think I've got better at it but I but I I've got much better at picking who I think we're a good fit for each other Mm. Which is probably very different. In fact, I know it's very different to how I started. So when I started, it was, yeah. I've got this need, and you'll feel that need without actually thinking it through from their perspective about whether them working for us is good for them. Yeah, yeah. And then I say to some people because we've been doing a lot of employment stuff through this time yeah. with um, clients, and what I've been saying is, you know, it frees if if you're not feeling it, they're yeah. not feeling it. No, and it frees them up to be doing something yes. that they love too. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you can think of it from their perspective and think, oh, it's going to be the end of the world because they won't have a job. But they'll get a job. Yeah. But I also think you've got to be a bit, I, I think what's come with maturity is the ability to be able to be empathic and mm. to be able to see things from other people's perspective. So you want to hope that as you get, as the business has been going for a while, that you've made enough mistakes and learned enough <laughs> lessons that that you're actually you've taken the wisdom from those situations. But I, I spent the first 10 years, I think, taking every resignation as a personal affront. Affront, okay. And it really got in the way. So, yeah. And the challenge is there, of course, is that that's not fair to them. Yeah. But it also puts you through so much unnecessary yes. angst because Wrong. they don't care. You, you know, no. at, at the end of the day, you're not, you're not, you're creating jobs and livelihoods for people. But because I take my job so seriously, mm you assume that everybody else mm. must do, which means I had this massive responsibility to mm. make sure everyone was having a good time all the time. And that's exhausting. Mm. So I probably wasn't the best. But interestingly enough, someone reached out to me on LinkedIn. Oh, I had quite a we had a challenging probably last three months of the time she was with us. And she reached out, she's now very happy where she is. I think this is probably a few years down the line. And she just reached out on LinkedIn and said, thank you so much. I learned so much being with you. And I know I was a difficult employee, oh. which I thought was really lovely. <laughs> and I just actually said to her, actually, I learned a lot managing you about, about how to approach things, how to, how to use the right language, how mm. to be empathic, how, all those things that you hope. And I said it was a real watershed moment. So it was one of those moments where we were all going, oh, thank you, and I'm sorry. And yeah. it, was, it was actually really lovely. Yeah, good. Mm, but it didn't feel like that at the time. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound <laughs> it like doesn't. it did. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, so following on from Better Business Basics, you started the Entrepreneur Experiment mm. and Number Lust. Yes. Tell us more about both of those ventures. Okay. Number Lust uh, is interesting because it's uh, I have a co-founder there, Ben, who – um, has added substantially to what we do, how we approach it, but it's been a really good exercise for me to have a partner mm. because I've always been a want to do this on my own. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, striving forward. Um, and it's been I've learned so much about myself and working closely with others in partnership, which I think is, is you know, like a marriage. It's, it's challenging at times, but but 
but when you think about what you can achieve and what you can do, it's it's worth it. But it, mm-hmm. I had to be a certain age, I think, before um, I was ready to do that. So I think he came along at the right time, which is good news for Ben. Um, and that's a platform which takes sort of human expertise and data from SMEs to create um, not only insights, but almost an auto advisory model that allows SMEs to sort of just make better decisions. And Mm -hmm. so it's not a benchmarking tool per se, but it's about seeing how technology and AI and patterns within small business uh, financial data can actually help underpin decisions rather than just saying this feels right, which Mm -hmm. is the way most small businesses tend to certainly start and continue. Um, And I think that's the danger if you're running very much on intuition, Mm. is you get to a point where that actually leaves you, I think, um, and you don't realise it. Mm. And so you're making decisions which aren't based on fact, they're mm. based on how you feel, Feeling. which is a bit more difficult once it gets bigger because mm. then you are a bit, you should be a bit more out of touch with the detail, so mm. therefore you lose the connection mm. with your intuition, if that makes any sense. So um, that's really about taking uh, a service-based business and then marrying it with data and seeing what can come out and how... Um, just businesses can be a bit more, a bit smarter in how they mm. how they make the decisions they need to make. And the entrepreneur experiment is probably one of those things that is really just conversations around what we what we were talking about before, which is why people choose the businesses they do. So I find that bit fascinating. Mm. So when you sit down and talk to entrepreneurs or people who start businesses. Um, you know, okay, so why did you choose that business and why there and why now? And, and, and very often people don't, haven't really thought about it or they've thought about it but on a very conscious level. Mm. But I think there's a real story that sits underneath people's choices, mm. which you have to tease out a bit. And I, I don't quite know what I'm going to do with it, but I just love, I love talking to people about why they've ended up where they have. Mm. Um, and it does uncover things, I think, as you talk to people about, well, okay, it's interesting that you've chosen that, mm. that particular industry and that particular way of approach, especially entrepreneurship where they're, where they're trying to create something that doesn't exist. Mm. You know, so, but I think that's going to be one of those passion projects that has to wait until I've retired mm-hmm. or my children have left home, <laughs> probably. So you are very busy, but yes. you've been doing mentoring. Yes, yeah, so I do. Uh, I do. I mentor and supervise MBA graduates mm-hmm. or, or M- people going through their MBA. So yes. I did mine at Adelaide Uni, which mm-hmm. I loved. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got the opportunity. It was one of those moments where someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, "Would you do it?" And I thought, "God, you've got the wrong person." <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't actually think you went to sort of. But I've. Um, I've really enjoyed it, and I think it. It's. It was. It's. It's a good opportunity to spend time out of the out of the business Mm -hmm. but I think it also again it sort of feeds that curiosity I'm actually quite nosy Mm -hmm. I think and not nosy in 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 an unpleasant way but nosy as in I'm deeply curious about Mm -hmm. about people and their lives and and um you know you you get a snapshot in, in someone's life for probably a five or six month period and understanding why they've chosen an MBA, why Adelaide, why, mm. you know, it's 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 just really interesting. And you you have the privilege, I think, of dropping into their lives for a very short period of time. And you work very intensely mm-hmm. at a time, which is and it's the very last subject of their MBA. Yeah. So it's the glory yeah, subject. It is. <laughs> it's like, yes, we did this yes, together. <laughs> that's right. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, no, I, I had a bit of a a bit of a, I think, a nervous breakdown in the middle of mine because I got to sort of, it's a bit like a marathon, I got to month five, sorry, subject five, and I still had seven to go. And to me it was just How can this awful. still be? Not, I'm not even <laughs> how can halfway. This, how can this still be? Yeah. And um, I failed my accounting subject, oh, which God. was terrible that because if terrible. you think about it, it's like it's the subject I should have got. Yeah. But I was so lax. I was just so laid back about it and I was like, oh, yeah. I'll oh, be fine. I'll nail this. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be fine. And I failed. And they called me in and said, okay, you've got two choices. You do the subject again or you um, or you do like a supplementary. And I said, no, 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 if I failed, I need to do this again. So I made myself go through it again. but With a different um, attitude. Yeah, totally different. <laughs> With a very different attitude. But I do think that it was one of those moments where I could have bailed. Mm. 
Um, and so the beauty about mentoring people at that at that end point is is that like they've done it. Yeah. Like it's yeah. it's so you, not it's a joyful experience. Crisis. Yeah, it's a joyful experience. <laughs> You're not picking people up off the floor and telling them they can do it. It's actually they already know they can mm. do it. So, which is great. So, um, yeah. So I enjoy. I, I wish I could do more. Actually, mentoring. I do love it. What would you say the biggest learning curve of your career has been? Um, I think I'm more effect. I have. I use my resources much more effectively so my time management skills were shocking my, my mother came over here about five years ago and she said I can't recognize you so I said what do you mean she said you, you're just you're on time <laughs> she said like it's just it's a miracle and I said no it's really not I said I've just learned that it's actually quite insulting to to rock up late to somebody again it's one of those things that comes with experience mm. it comes with a couple of bad feedback yeah and someone saying to you actually this is not okay what do you mean it's not okay? You're half an hour late. <laughs> no, I've always been. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, and then just, just so just managing resources, whether it be time, knowledge, um, money, you know, experience, whatever it may be, I've just got m- more effective in terms of using it based on outcome. And I think um, uh, that, and I think the other one was was understanding the power of no. A nice no, mm. as in you know. So always was always an overcommitter, mm-hmm. underdeliverer, uh, and it came from a a great like a lovely place of wanting to help everybody. But I'm a bit of a rescuer, mm. and so the danger is there is you go, yeah, give it to me, I can do it. Yep, give it to me, I can do it, and then you let people down. And I think that's another one which you have to actually learn to go through with terrible feedback mm. or painful feedback from people who really care about. Um, how you move through the world, mm. of which are a few, mm-hmm. um, who are brave enough to actually say, "No, actually, this is this is wrong. Mm. Can't do that." Okay, <laughs> and so you change. Take it, it on board. Yeah. yeah. So your eighteen-year-old self has just walked into the room. What would you say to them? Oh God! Um, when it was a while ago, I'm just trying to think. Um, I would. So I think I've lived my life in my adult life in two halves there's the fearful half and the brave half so if I if I was to sort of describe it that way and I think um for me sort of post-children and pre-children this probably coincides quite nicely but I sort of was my 20s were full of angst and worry and anxiety around where do I fear what am I going to do and I think I had because I had very um high achieving parents Mm. And whilst it's not the, it, it's not about um, we didn't we didn't live in a real um, tough childhood in terms of achievement there, but I was always aware that you're here for one life, that's it, you know, make the most of it. And because my parents both came from very humble beginnings and actually did very well mm. um, in terms of happy, um, had succeeded in lots of different areas of life. Mm. Um, I felt this responsibility, pressure. yeah, and pressure to actually. And I stressed about it terribly. Wow. Um, and then I had children and then it all goes out the window in terms of what you know you're capable of doing mm. and, and what's and then I think I was much kinder to myself. Mm. And and so I think I so I hit fifty and thought, actually I feel all right. I actually feel really calm. I've sort of so I think it, I'd go back and just say, look, just don't chill out. Yeah, just don't stress about it. Like it's really and that that sort of that theory that you have or that that fallacy that you have that you can control everything Mm. it's just rubbish like I look at my Mm. children now and I just you know they're stressing about things that really don't matter Mm. but no one can tell you that you've actually got to experience it Mm. so I think I've probably wasted a lot of time stressing about stuff that really doesn't matter Mm. yeah or that you couldn't control anyway no what was the last book you read cover to cover uh out of Africa Oh. I know because I'm not a, I'm not a fiction reader at all. I actually, if you looked at a book collection at home, you'd be lucky if you hit one percent <laughs> of fiction versus. So I love bios. Mm-hmm. I love um, political biographies. I love I love reading about people's lives. Yeah. And, and, so I find that much more interesting. Fiction really doesn't do. And and someone did tell me that the reason is because no one's ever introduced me to good fiction. Oh, and that's probably right. Okay. So I'm probably, I can probably, maybe I should be converted. Yeah. Um, but I, Out of Africa does a few things for me. It is, 
obviously set in Africa, it, it because we can't travel at the moment, I feel very claustrophobic. Mm-hmm. And so whether I would have travelled or not in this period, Doesn't I matter. don't know. The fact <laughs> it's I still, you still feel that way. <laughs> the fact I can't just makes me feel like I just feel <gasps> a bit like this. But um, so I love the expanse of, of that book. I mean, I think it describes the plains in Africa beautifully. It's very much a book set um, in you know, wide open spaces. Um, I love the period in which it's set. So it, it, it it's a wonderful way of learning about the history of a country and of a time or um, and the way women lived and the way people lived um, at that time as part of the story. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm a bit of a romantic. I think it's it's a beautiful story. It's a bit sad but at the end, but it's um it's for me it was a book that that was important to reread. Mm-hmm get onto it yeah that's a good one what is your purpose from a personal perspective it's very much about being the best parent I can be and you know it's been a it's a wonderful experience but it's been I I just a it still floors me when I look at my children now that they've made it (laughs) you know it's 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 such a big responsibility mm. and you really no one tells you this and even if someone did I don't think you really take it on board but it is um it's a wonderful it is wonderful and I and I've loved it but god it's a roller coaster ride mm. and I think so I think if my parents can if if my children can look back and and they do although this is what they tell me um that I've been a I've been a good parent a mm. fair parent and I think that that that's all that I, I really need. They're the only two people I'm answerable to, really, mm-hmm. in that sense. You know, I, you want them to like you as a human being, um, which is tricky. I think for my um, my team, it's just about making sure that they feel safe and secure. And But I also wanted to, I had, I had a, a big thing to prove about making sure that you could build a part-time team. Mm-hmm. And it was a real, it, I, I set out right at the beginning to make sure that it could be done. And I was determined it could be done, and and I believe it can be done, and it's been proven to be the case. But mm. we've got we've got really interesting people that work for us who do other things outside the yeah, work that for that's us, great. which I think is fantastic. And I think it's sort of dispelled the myth around you know part time employment, part time brain, mm. and and I you know it's always angered me deeply that 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 women when they have children have feel as if they have to downgrade or put their careers on hold and mm. I, that I never understood and I think it's really lovely to start to see men working part-time mm. so you when you interview a man and they say actually I want four days a week and they're actually okay about it yeah is really lovely to see my stepdad is a lawyer yeah. or was a lawyer he's retired now but he worked four days and mm. he went painting yeah. on Wednesday every so week. whatever it is that does it for you yeah it's like it's, and I loved that yeah so we I've had we've had people working for us who have been um, bodybuilders We've had people who are studying. We've had people who've got elderly parents. We've got people who've got obviously young children. Mm. Um, but that sort of that question we ask at interview, which is, okay, you want three days a week, you know, three days a week with us. What do you do the rest of the time? Mm. Always opens up a really interesting conversation. conversation yeah, and I I love that aspect. And I think um, you know, so I think that that's the purpose there. I think for customers, it's really around oh, just saving them from the unnecessary pain of or the the pain of business failure when it's unnecessary mm. you know some businesses obviously um start and fail and that's the nature of 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 business starting business and some are always going to not work out for different reasons and mm. that's fine but i'm still amazed at how many businesses don't work um and and they they should have and mm. could have worked mm. Uh, just with the right support. And then I think spiritually, like overall, I just want to put more in than I take out. Whatever that whatever that looks whatever like. That is, yeah. yeah. Um, not easy sometimes. But <laughs> <laughs> I do try my It's a good best. theory. <laughs> it is a good theory. Uh, I fail probably abysmally most of the time. But I do, I do think, I think, you know, you, you want to be at peace. What did you do before I you worked at a clothes. Account? Did you? Yes. So well, I did a whole right brain thing. I've fashion. had a yes, I've had a real. Um, I reckon I've had a lobotomy, <laughs> a little bit like a like a right brain to left brain movement. But being in business, you need the right brain. Yeah, you do, and I, it's interesting because uh, 
my father, who's not alive anymore, but was always um, disappointed is not the right word, but he never understood how I ended up where I ended up because he said to me, you know, it's so different from where you started. What you, yeah, so when I left school worked. at 18, I, I did I, lots of creative things at school. Um, I designed clothing. I, you know, I got sponsorship from the British Fashion Council. Um, it was so, you know, my my design career started at the same time as Alexander McQueen. Wow. You know, and I, you know, for me it was just, and I did it until I had children. I just loved it. It was, but, and so I think what I love is the creative side of mm. business. Yeah. Know, well, business models, is that. business. Yeah. It's, so I think that's it's a different the, take on. It is. But I look back on on my tear sheets, my sort of newspaper and magazine tear sheets, and, and it's like looking at somebody else. Mm. But it's a terrible business to make money in. Um, very totally. few people actually make a living. Yeah. It's very boom and busty. Again, there's a there's a bit of a pattern happening there's here, a but trend is... there is. But it's um, I still. It's probably a bit a bit weird, but when I go into shops where there's fabric or colour. You can see me sort of stroking things. <laughs> people probably think I'm a bit strange, but you know, like so if there's a sofa, I have to sort of put my arm, put my hand along it. Yep. You're so I'm touchy, yeah, you're tactile. Yeah, I'm a very touchy feely type of, and so and I love colour or things. So I'll I'll cut things out of magazines or I'll keep I'll keep packaging if it's got something like a beautiful cool. font or a beautiful yeah. So that there's there's still a bit of a remnant there, and I I probably will end up going back there. I think at some point. Cool. So maybe like your stepfather, I'll do four days a week and one day a week. Yeah, I'll design. Do something creative, yeah. Thanks for coming in. Pleasure. I really enjoyed it. It's been great. Thank yeah. you very much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast today. If you're still listening, you can find the show notes on our website, ulegal.com.au. You're welcome to go ahead and subscribe, leave a review, and share the podcast with anyone that you think might benefit from it, anyone that you think is open to helping us create a world with a purpose that's higher than profit. If you're an accountant on purpose, feel free to find our Facebook page and join our community.